Vladimir Putin has staked his entire, not just immediate political reputation, he staked his entire legacy on conquering Ukraine. This was to be his gift to greater Russia. He is a man in his 70s who has been at the top of the Russian leadership for 25 years. But he is a man who knows he may not have that many years left. And he wanted this to be his crowning achievement. And it wasn't. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. Today we're talking about the war in Ukraine and the entirely predictable results of the Russian presidential election with Professor Scott Lucas from the Clinton Institute at the University College Dublin. Scott, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us again. Hi, James. Thank you for letting me sneak back in. First of all, is there anything in the Russian election results that surprises you or that you think is noteworthy? <laughs> uh, no, because it wasn't an election. It was a show. Uh, it was an elaborate show that was put on by the Kremlin for yet another six year term for Vladimir Putin. Uh, it was not an election in the sense that no opposition candidate who could possibly garner significant support was allowed to stand. Indeed, one of those prospective candidates, Alexei Navalny, uh, suddenly died in February after being given more than 30 years in prison. Other candidates, like Ekaterina Donsova, Boris Nadezhdin, were blocked from standing after they suddenly collected hundreds of thousands of signatures. Uh, the Kremlin had almost a monopoly on media about the election. And the four token candidates that were put up against Vladimir Putin effectively endorsed Vladimir Putin to win the contest. So no, I mean, even calling it an election, I mean, maybe we can say orchestrated election, man managed election, even election dignifies it you know, too much. But that's not to say that it did not have a serious purpose. The purpose was to try to give a veneer of legitimacy to Vladimir Putin at home uh, because of his problems abroad. And by that, I mean, we are now into the third war of his failed effort to conquer Ukraine. We're now looking at Russia possibly having to mobilize hundreds of thousands of more personnel if they actually want to try to conquer Ukraine. Putin needs to have some type of justification for doing that. Uh, Russia's economy has not collapsed. It is still taking over as a wartime economy, but it's a, an economy which is borrowing against time. It cannot continue to try to maintain this pace as sanctions are having an effect. And of course, Russia is increasingly isolated, you know, in the international community. So Putin's last roll of the dice is propaganda warfare, propaganda warfare to tell the West, tell the international community, you've got to stop abandoning Ukraine. And the flip side of that is he presents himself as, oh, look at me, all these people love me with my 87.28% of the vote. You know, why would you bother to stand against me when quite clearly I could be president of Russia for life? Just just one more question on the elections themselves. Do you have a view, Scott, on, on how best for people who are opposed to Putin can make their feelings known through the electoral process? I mean, is it things like the noon against Putin process that tried to happen? We saw some people destroying ballot boxes, setting off fireworks in polling stations. Clearly, that's an incredibly brave thing to do because you're probably liable to end up in prison. Some people would say, actually, the best thing you could do is, is not turn out and to depress the turnout. Is there a good way for people who are opposed to Putin in Russia to, to make their feelings known? That's up for the Russian people themselves. I mean, they're the ones who carry the risk of any protest. Uh, we had about 75 people that were confirmed to be arrested. It wasn't a huge number because the nature of the protest was, oh, we're, we've just lined up to vote. You know, why would you arrest us for voting? Uh, there were arrests for uh, those who poured ink into ballot boxes. Uh, there were supposedly those who did try to throw Molotov cocktails into polling stations. Indeed, some were set on fire. Uh, but for the vast majority of those thousands who did turn out inside Russia, not to mention the tens of thousands outside Russia, Russian nationals who protested uh, around embassies across the world. You know, they, they were peaceful protests. Uh, they were protests that were there to say, not only do we not see these elections as legitimate, this is not the type of country that we want going forward. Um, so however they chose to make their voice heard, however they chose to make themselves seen, uh, it's not my place to, to advise them, it's my place to honor them. 
What do you think we will see now from the Kremlin? I mean, you mentioned earlier on, you think there'll probably be some fresh wave of mobilisation. Do you think we might hear about that in the coming weeks? I think you could. I mean, you already saw it yesterday in terms of the the, the Red Square celebration, you know, the, the party after uh, the staged election, as it were, when Vladimir Putin came out and made some of these sweeping statements, for example, effectively saying, we're going to hold on to part of Ukraine forever as a so-called buffer zone, uh, proclaiming, because this also happened to be the 10th anniversary of Russia's illegal seizure of Crimea, that the peninsula would forever be Russian. So, you know, he is staking out this expansionist ground, which does not indicate, oh, I'm ready to negotiate, I'm ready to sit down and get a resolution. He, he's going to try to seize as much territory as possible. Uh, but again, to seize as much territory as possible, you know, is going to come at a cost. Uh, just to simply take those two towns and cities that have been taken since July 2022, and only two towns and cities that have been taken, have cost many tens of thousands of Russian lives, many hundreds of thousands of casualties, just to, to take that territory. So, you know, the, the media headlines that Russia is winning, or that somehow, you know, it's grinding Ukraine into defeat, completely ignores the fact that the high cost for the Russians means that these very limited gains cannot be sustained on a wider basis, unless Putin well, tries to find the personnel from somewhere, tries to find the manufacturing from somewhere. Uh, that's going to be a tall order for him to achieve, but he has to keep on telling the Russian people, I'm the guy who can do it. That's really interesting. Let's just unpick that a bit more. I mean, in terms of what we're seeing on the front line itself at the moment, a lot of people suggest that actually, if anything, it's maybe favouring Russia because they've made these incremental gains, for example, the capture of, of Avdivka. But actually, are you saying that, that because of the, you know, still very, very high Russian casualty rate and because of the success that, for example, Ukraine have had at targeting bits of energy infrastructure behind Russian lines and in Russia itself, you actually think it's, it's more nuanced than that? Well, your, your key word that you gave me is incremental. You know, the, the fact is, all right, we, we've got Bakhmut fell in May of 2023 in the same region, in the Donetsk region, Avdivka fell a few weeks ago, and then the Russians have taken a few more villages besides that. But this is not like a sweeping advance through Ukrainian territory, uh, similar to the Ukrainian counteroffensive that took most of the Northeast and part of the East back in the autumn of 2022. Uh, this is sort of a grinding gain of, you know, a few kilometers almost reminiscent if for those people who are old enough to remember of uh, scenes in Black Adder 4, where uh, they present like a one meter by one meter square of ground uh, that, that has been liberated from the Germans. And they say, what's the scale of that? Oh, well, it's one to one. <laughs> That's the one meter that we took. Um, you know, how far Vladimir Putin can play General Melchit, we'll see. Because the other dimension that you refer to is... Uh, the fact that there is a war beyond the front lines, there are operations beyond the front lines, and Ukraine has been hitting Russia hard. Uh, within the past week, six Russian oil refineries set on fire, including the second largest refinery in Russia, which, by the way, was more than a thousand kilometers from the Ukrainian border. That's how deep they struck. The seventh large, largest refinery was struck. Up to 15% of Russia's uh, production of refined oil was affected. Now, of course, they will make repairs to those refineries, but at the same time, Ukraine has been hitting warships, they've been hitting ports, they've actually broken uh, the Russian fleet in the Western Black Sea. Um, so I, I think there is an imminent pinch point for Ukraine. We know that they are, uh, you know, Russia has about a seven to one advantage in artillery shells. We know those artillery shells lead to those incremental gains that you talk about. We know that that Russian advantage is compounded by the blackmail uh, on U USA by Trumpist and hardware Republicans. So let's not pretend that in that aspect of the war, the frontline situation in the East, that it's not serious. It is, as Ukrainian leaders recognize. But that's also only one aspect of the war. Um, and when you consider the long distance wars as well, when you consider the economic and political wars that are being waged, um, again, it, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but this is not a case that Vladimir Putin is anywhere close to victory. Um, and indeed, the tide could turn, could turn in 2024 if a couple of key things shift.
which I'll be happy to explain to you if you wish. Well, I'm sure one of the key ones is, as you kind of, you know, inferred there, Scott, is is what happens in Congress with this aid package and or in the Senate, I should say, you know, wh- whether it passes um, and or Congress rather. Um, Lindsey Graham was in Kiev yesterday. Any any sign of some movement there? Uh, it was an interesting and uh, let's say, as Facebook would put it, complicated relationship that played out there because Vladimir Zelensky, of course, welcomed Lindsey Graham because Zelensky's going to try to appeal to Congress uh, to finally get this measure through the House. It's, it has passed the Senate for $60 billion of aid. Uh, Lindsey Graham, who portrays himself as a staunch defender of Ukraine's resistance, actually voted against that aid last month when the Senate passed it. And he spent yesterday in Kiev saying, oh, well, maybe you could have it as a loan. Now, the reason why that's significant is, is because one of the guys who says, oh, we have to loan this money to Ukraine and not give it away is Donald Trump. So Lindsey Graham is playing politics in an election year with this. That said, I think there may be a compromise on the way in the House, which is that some part of the $60 billion may be in the form of a low interest loan. And I think Kiev will probably accept that, especially if they don't have to repay that money in the next few weeks or few months, because that aid is so vital. So I think a compromise is on the way. Uh, But I think the problem here is, is that the practical, logical line is, is that, yes, this aid will be adopted. It will get through with Republicans joining Democrats in the House to finally break the blockade. But the Trumpists aren't logical. Uh, the Trumpists actually are trying to prevent any aid getting to Ukraine because they don't give a damn about Ukraine. They want to see Donald Trump get reelected. And the further that Ukraine collapses, the more they can say, look how terrible it is under Joe Biden's watch. We'll bring Donald Trump in. And as Trump said only yesterday, he'll bring peace to Ukraine, Russia and the rest of the world. And, th- and that is a major issue, surely, because even if this aid package does indeed pass Congress and then it gets delivered to the front line, that's realistically the last bit of American aid that, that the Ukrainians are going to see this side of the election. I, I, you know, it is, it is a, a worry, but I got to be honest with you, we're eight months away. And what we're talking about is an immediate situation here, which is holding the line for the next eight months. Now, if Donald Trump did get in in November 2024, if he didn't wind up in prison by 2025 and was allowed to be president, Yes, this is a man who blackmailed Ukraine in 2019, who froze its military aid simply because it would not dish dirt on Joe Biden. Uh, He is a petty, vindictive man. He is also a man who is an admirer of Vladimir Putin. So we know which way it goes. But I have to be honest with you, the way that Trump has imploded in the last 72 hours on the campaign trail opens up a ray of light, not just about the Ukraine issue, but about all the other important issues that need to be discussed and that he is incapable of discussing. So I guess what I'm saying to you is, all right, we, we've got dark clouds on the horizon, but we've got the storm clouds that need to be dispelled immediately. And that's where I would like to focus. One of the other things we, we've seen in recent weeks is some of the rhetoric, particularly from Emmanuel Macron, but some other European leaders as well, appearing to suggest a kind of hardening of position towards Russia. And of course, Macron, when uh, the full-scale invasion happened, what was seen as a bit more dovish in relation to, to Vladimir Putin. Now he appears to be an ultra hawk. What do you think explains his shift in position? Let's let's explain this by layers. I mean, the first layer of this, which builds from what we just talked about the United States is, is that European leaders are recognizing they cannot just simply depend on the United States to do the right thing. So Europe has to step up and provide vital assistance for Ukraine. And to the credit of European leaders, they have been doing it. Not always quickly as we like, uh, but the fact is, is that they are making the effort to step up the delivery of artillery rounds. They are making the effort to provide the US made F-16 fighter jets later this year. They are already providing, Britain and France are already providing the long range missiles that are carrying out those attacks deep inside Russia and in Russian occupied Crimea. So that's the first layer. There is a second layer, however, which is is that there are key elements of aid which are not being delivered. And here it's Germany, which is not delivering the Taurus long range missiles, which could reinforce that advantage that Ukraine's building up 
uh, and being able to strike behind the front lines. And Macron's using a bit of leverage there by telling Germany, look, I'm stepping up here, what about you? But then the third layer is very much Macron saying, we can't rule out anything. And we, you know, we've got to talk about European and NATO troops that might go into Ukraine. And I think we need to be clear here. What Macron is saying is not that these are going to be troops on the front line. He's talking about troops that will provide logistical and intelligence support while being inside Ukraine. And let me let your viewers in on a secret. Without buying into Vladimir Putin's, uh, I'll use a polite word, I'll just call it conspiracy theory, um, about NATO being responsible for this entire war and aggression, there are British and, for, and French personnel who are probably already inside Ukraine. They're already providing the advice, the targeting advice for the storm shadow and scout missiles that are being fired from Ukraine. You know, uh, let, let's put it this way. I could not possibly comment on the record about that, uh, but I think it's pretty much known. Um, and what Macron was sort of doing was was letting that come out in a different way to say this is where we are. And so I think he was he was pushing people to have the discussion. Uh, it is a contingency plan. I think the contingency plan is if Russia pursues the offenses even further, if they throw many more men in, then Macron's saying we may have to respond in this way. And he's not alone. Although most European leaders kick back against that because publicly they don't want to talk about the deployment at this point. He did get support from the Baltic states and he got a, he got a measure of support from Poland without actually supporting the deployment both Poland and the Czech Republic said, well, there, there could be some types of logistical support we could provide. So I, I think Macron grabbed headlines at a key moment to say this is a serious issue. We need to recognize how serious it is. He certainly accomplished that. And then he has actually put a marker down for the discussions that may need to take place later. And I suppose that is the language that Vladimir Putin understands. I mean, like any bully, essentially, you know, he, he responds to other acts of aggression. And, you know, whether he believes Macron or whether he just thinks he's bluffing, I suppose, is a, you know, it's quite a relevant question. But it's a language that Putin understands when people talk tough with him. It was, but, but at the same time that Putin would understand that there's a bit of tough talk there, it was also strategic ambiguity is the phrase that analysts would put for it. And that is Macron was not saying, we're definitely going to do this. He was not giving a timetable for when he's doing this. He says, this could be done, right? This could be done. You know, take a guess, Russia, in terms of where we are going to go next. And again, this takes us back to our wider discussion. The easy thing as analysts for the look at is the front lines. That's the easy thing for people, you know, whether they're in Washington or London or the rest of Europe or in Asia to comment on. What is much harder to track in this war is what is happening in terms of well behind the front lines, in terms of the missile strikes, the drone strikes, the sabotage operations that are going on. Um, it is much harder for anyone to gauge the effects of what's taking place. And a lot of the ambiguity as represented by Macron was not just simply, are we gonna put troops into to Ukraine? But how much further do you think we could go with those missile and drone strikes? How much further do you think Ukraine can go with that? How much damage can they wield against you? Um, I, I'll just give you breaking news today, which actually confirms the effect of some of this. Um, we'd known it for days. It, it was actually out on social media channels, Russian social media channels. But the, uh, the head of Russia's Navy just got replaced. It's been formally confirmed. And why do you think the head of Russia's Navy got replaced? It's not because they're winning the war. It's because a third of the Black Sea fleet, fleet isn't operating. And indeed, remember the flagship of the Russian Navy is still sitting at the bottom of the Black Sea. So, you know, uh, ambiguity in terms of results behind the front line, how much further can we go uh, in terms of, of hitting you? It's interesting, just to contrast, that when Russia hits Ukraine, more and more of their attacks are not hitting those vital energy positions. They're not hitting the ports. More and more of their attacks are hitting civilian areas. They're just firing missiles and firing drones and just to cause terror amongst the population. The Ukrainian strikes are hitting strategic targets. Um, and, you know, at some point, uh, well, the Russians are implicitly owning up to that with the replacement of personnel, whether they own up to it publicly uh, in terms of this is how much pain it's going to cause their economy and their military. That's a different matter. What, what do you think explains Russia's inability to defend sort of some of its own energy infrastructure better. I mean, is it is it strategic leadership failures? Is it 
because it's the nature of when you're having an offensive war, you, you maybe leave yourself open to, to counterattack. What, what explains it? Your air defenses aren't fit for purpose in some of those areas. They simply put so much effort into what you might call the preparations for the offensive operations, right? So more and more tanks, more and more artillery, more and more munitions, that they didn't actually put the investment into the air defenses. And to be honest with you, why should they? Because Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin planned this out, that they would be in control of Kyiv within a few weeks. Uh, they didn't plan on this being a war going into its third year, and they certainly didn't, didn't plan on Ukraine capturing territory, recapturing territory close to the border. And they certainly didn't plan on Ukraine being able to develop uh, attack drones and being supplied with long-range missiles. Didn't foresee any of that. So what you have seen, in fact, has been a scramble by the Russians to put up air defenses around vital positions, including Putin's palaces, by the way. Uh, but you can't put those air defenses up around every oil refinery quickly. And you're seeing where the gaps are in the Russian defenses. Do you think we'll see any significant shift in Germany's position? I mean, they would say that, you know, since the start of the conflict, they have provided, uh, you know, weaponry and military aid on a scale never before seen, you know, in, in modern Germany. And yet, as you mentioned, they're reluctant to send these tourist missiles to the front line. Do you think we'll see a, a shift at all in Olaf Scholz's position? I think that's a huge question because there's a split in this cabinet. Um, it was very interesting that even as Olaf Scholz said again and again, including in the Bundestag, which voted down a proposal by the opposition to supply the missiles, you know, I will never be the chancellor who does this. His foreign minister, Annalena Baerbach, member of the Green Party, by the way, has said yes, that, that we should consider, for example, a proposal that was put forth by David Cameron, the UK foreign secretary, which is that uh, Germany will provide Tauruses to Britain, not to Ukraine, but Britain will then have the German Tauruses so it can then give the storm shadows, those long range missiles to Ukraine. Now, why does that make a difference? Because again, because there is an element of British control over the storm shadows, the Germans can live with that if the storm shadows are being used. Now, Schultz has not commented on that specific proposal. That's still out there, nor have we heard from the defense minister, Boris Pistorius, but I think this this is not an open and shut case. I think that workaround deal could happen uh, at some point in the next few months. What, what explains it is a really, really interesting internal tension you outlined there, Scott, between Annalena Burbach, who, as you mentioned, is a member of the, the German Green Party, seen as being to the left of Olaf Scholz's SDP party. What Because you would assume that someone on the further to the left might be might be less hawkish, and yet we're seeing the Greens in Germany being pretty hawkish. Because sometimes politicians are moral people. And Annalena Baerbach, and you, I, I like Annalena Baerbach, I'm just going to put it out there, as a politician, takes the moral and ethical position that uh, Ukraine has been attacked, that Ukraine is trying to defend itself, Ukraine's trying to survive, and you don't tie its hands as it tries to survive. And that is where she has been consistently. And one reason why, as you point out, quite right, that Germany has provided a lot of aid to Ukraine. Germany did, in the end, provide the Leopard tanks, for example, to Ukraine. Germany has provided munitions to Ukraine. Part of the reason for that was because Annalena Baerbach kept pressing and pressing and pressing the moral and the ethical case. Now, at the same time, we have to recognize where Schultz's position comes from is, is a different type of morality as it will, which is, well, you know, you go back to World War II, you go back to Germany's history, you go back to the limits on Germany as a military power, especially intervening in other areas. And Schultz comes out of that tradition. You know, we don't intervene in other countries. We don't like to be seen as basically being part of, you know, alongside a belligerent, albeit a belligerent who's defending itself. So you have basically two different concepts of what constitutes a moral position as well as the practical military and political considerations in play. Just finally, Scott, what do you think Vladimir Putin's thinking is at the moment? He's successfully been re-elected, but he's got issues on the front line and indeed behind his, his front line. Is he confident at the moment? Is he anxious? Is he somewhere in between? I know I'm asking you to engage in a bit of criminology here, but, but where do you think his mindset is at the moment? I'm not sure I can read Vladimir Putin's mind because I suspect there's elements of all of them that are there. What I 
would probably say is what Vladimir Putin does. Look, uh, I would, one of my kids taught me one time that a shark always has to move forward because if a shark stops moving forward, it dies. Uh, it cannot stop from proceeding, no matter what the obstacles are in the way. And you know what? If you have a Soviet or Russian leader who stops moving forward, sometimes literally, that Soviet or Russian leader could die. Vladimir Putin has staked his entire, not just immediate political reputation, he staked his entire legacy on conquering Ukraine. This was to be his gift to greater Russia. He is a man in his 70s who has been at the top of the Russian leadership for 25 years. But he is a man who knows he may not have that many years left. And he wanted this to be his crowning achievement. And it wasn't. It simply wasn't. But he can't stop. If he stops swimming and proceeding forward, if he stops trying to beat the shark, posing as the shark, I've got nuclear weapons. I've got the conventional forces. If he stops swimming forward, that's it. He's gone. So he won't stop. And I'm going to say that very clearly because I know the comments we're going to get on the YouTube comments right now. And I'm also going to say it to all those activists, whether or not they're well-intentioned in the UK, in the US, in Europe, and in other places. You know, you might shout and shout and shout, oh, well, why don't we just negotiate? Why don't we just negotiate? Just negotiate and save lives. Vladimir Putin doesn't want to negotiate. Vladimir Putin doesn't want an agreement, a compromise. Vladimir Putin wants to win. And winning means no more Ukraine. And don't trust me on it. The guy who said that a few days ago, the guy named Dmitry Medvedev, who used to be president of this Russia and is still the deputy leader of the State Security Council. Professor Scott Lucas, we always appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us today on Frontline. Thank you, James, and thanks to all your viewers. Thank you for watching Frontline for Times Radio. For more, click subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can listen to Times Radio and you can read more about the war in Ukraine and global security with your Times digital subscription.